So welcome to our event on decision making under, um, under uncertainty. My name is Peter Childs and I'm a professor in the Dyson School of Design Engineering at Imperial. This event will explore with Imperial academics, industry and startups, how new algorithms, modeling techniques and tools actually help or can help businesses to make smart decisions that improve efficiency, resilience and expected value in the face of uncertainty. We're going to start with three short presentations, followed by some Q&A. We're going to ask you to actually use the questions tab in the AirMeet facility to participate so that your questions can be seen by us and even voted in terms of their popularity by all of us. So we've got three great speakers. They're just going to speak for about three minutes each to leave plenty of time for Q&A and audience participation. And our first speaker is, is Ruth Meisner. And Ruth is Professor of Computational Optimization in the Department of Computing. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much, Peter. Really appreciate the introduction. And then also, thank you so much to the Imperial team for organizing such a nice event. Um, so I just have some slides. And what I'm going to do is share a few vignettes. So I'm in the Computational Optimization Group. There's quite a number of us who are investigators in the Computational Optimization Group. And we span a space from mixed integer optimization to uh, large scale nonlinear optimization to control to game theory. Um, but something that we have in common is that we all like to think about optimization under uncertainty. Now, this is a really, really big topic, and David Silverman did a really nice job of making a sort of big presentation that included a lot of our work. But I'm just going to mention a few vignettes. Uh, so the first one I'm going to mention is some collaboration that we've done with Royal Mail. So what happens at Royal Mail is that they have this contract with the government that they must deliver basically all of the mail within three days. So they make uh, these nice plans the night before and they say, okay, this is how our day is gonna go. Uh, so there's this planning stage. And then what happens is the day comes and there are broken down vans and there are people who are sick and everything goes wrong basically. So there are these disturbances and then they need to recover. And so what we did with Royal Mail was we thought about how can we plan the night before in a really careful sort of way that takes into account uh, what are the, the unfortunate things that might happen on the day so that then the day comes and all these uncertain things happen, how can we react very quickly? Another thing that we've done is we've worked with BSF. BSF is, of course, a very big chemicals company. Um, and what they've let us do is they've let us release this software open source. Um, what BSF is using this software for is that basically they have these experiments uh, that, they, that they take that give them some sort of data. The data is, of course, su subject to uncertainty, subject to noise. And then they also know that certain things are true. They know things like flow in is equal to flow out. And so there are physical constraints that come from physics, uh, from mechanistic models, and we combine them together. What we do is we put the data together with the physical constraints that we know into these this gradient boosted tree model. Um, and then uh, we do develop a design of experiments approach. This is available open source, uh, at least the part that is uh, sort of the algorithms. And then of course the BSF data is within BSF. The last project that I want to highlight uh, just as a quick example is a present is a work that we've done with Schlumberger. So what Schlumberger has is that uh, they have this geothermal unit that is drilling into rock. And what their geothermal unit is doing is that they can place weight on their bit and they can rotate their bit. Um, and so over time, this drill bit is going into the rock. And basically, this is equivalent to sampling a quite uncertain function because they don't know really what's happening under the surface or they don't know very well. Um, and so what we're doing is for the safety critical application, um, we're sort of taking into consideration what are the what is the degradation of the bit over time and when should it be pulled up uh, to try to minimize cost over time. So the algorithmic portion of what we've done is, again, available uh, open source. These are just three vignettes of what we've done. Um, and then I have a lot of collaborators within the uh, computational optimization group and be happy to uh, mention their work as well. All right. 
Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Ruth. It's great to see uh, the applications, but also that there's substance with all of your algorithms and the detailed maths behind it. And that's the speciality of Imperial, um, making sure the application and the substance are there. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a reminder, please do uh, place questions uh, using the Q&A function. That would be much appreciated so that we can raise those in a few moments. Our second speaker is Michelle Alexander Cardin. And Michelle is a senior lecturer in computational aided engineering. And all being well, Machine's going to tell us about his world of uncertainty. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you also for the Imperial team for arranging this. This is a pretty exciting event. Uh, so uh, and as an introduction for this panel, um, what I'd like to say and what also motivates the research I'm doing is um, that our world is facing important threats, and but also opportunities in the future stemming from climate change, healthcare, cyber, and physical terrorism. I think everyone will agree these are important issues these days. However, um, our critical infrastructures are often designed without explicit considerations of these uncertainty in the upfront design process. For instance, we're trying to optimize performance under deterministic forecasts like demand price or try to benefit from economies of scale. And so um, the result of the, the is that oftentimes our systems become highly vulnerable and also ignore potentially more profitable, sustainable and resilient solutions. Um, so I've seen these challenges in many sectors um, like aerospace, healthcare, oil and gas, building and real estate, uh, as well as transportation. Um, so if you just consider, for example, how strained uh, our healthcare infrastructures uh, were and are still uh, through the current pandemic uh, or the power outages that just happened in Texas or um, the kinds of system that we're going to need to uh, provide a human presence on the moon and Mars. So um, we're going to need to think about these uncertainties very carefully. And so going forward, uh, what motivates a lot of my work, uh, in my view, is that the engineering community needs to rethink how we design and manage uh, these complex systems in the future. So we basically need to change our approaches and make more explicit considerations um, of future uncertainties and risk to the upfront design stage. And one way to do this um, that's really important in the work I do is, is to try to design these systems for flexibility so they can adapt, evolve, change over time in a cost efficient manner uh, with the goal of reducing both exposure to downside risk, but also helping uh, systems, companies, government capitalize on upside opportunities. Uh, this also helps, in my view, provide sustainability through better use of limited resources, for instance, deploying capacity only if and when you need it. It also helps adapt and reconfigure after a severe disruption, so you can revert to pre-disruption performance or even uh, surpass it. Um, so I'll recognize that these are uh, extremely challenging tasks. Um, so future generations of engineers, I think, will need more advanced computational tools to do this, data-driven algorithms, digital processes to support these efforts in a collaborative setting. Um, that's why data-driven optimization, digital twin modeling, and 3D Virtualization will become of utmost importance in the future uh, to help engineers advise policymakers and business leaders on best design and management strategies. So in a nutshell, um, what I think is that our world is facing important challenges, but also opportunities in the decades to come stemming from climate change, healthcare, ongoing geopolitical tensions. Our systems designed today may be highly vulnerable or may not allow us to capture these opportunities and leave uh, exciting value on the table, basically. So going forward, I think we need to rethink how we design these systems to make them more sustainable, resilient, with the goal of delivering better value. And this can be done by exploiting the concept of flexibility uh, and uh, supported by more advanced computational tools, the kind that um, Ruth has described, uh, also to help better support policy decision-making and business leaders in design and management decision-making. So that is my introduction. Thank you, Peter. Thank you ever so much, Michelle. That's fantastic. The whole notion of data-driven design is a challenge, and we can all see that. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for beginning to engage with the questions. We've got um, a few questions up and more coming, and our panelists will be looking at those as they come in. So 
Um, yeah, good questions. Our third speaker is um, Maria Angeles Diaz, and she is the EMEA and India Sales Vice President and General Manager at Agilent Technologies. And many people know Agilent at Imperial because they have been and are a long-standing research partner with the college. Maria, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Peter. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, once again, thank you to Imperial for organizing this. Um, so, you know, before I go into, into the topic, uh, and as you were saying about, uh, you were mentioning our partnership with Imperial, um, just for those of you that are not familiar with Agilent, um, it's uh, a company that, uh, it's a healthcare and life science company um, spin-off from Hewlett Parker. So we have a, a long trajectory in uh, uh, research and, and supporting all of these different markets. Um, my contribution to the panel today, it's coming from an industry perspective, looking more specifically into business and organizations and how do we deal with uncertainty? Because this is impacting um, our business and our customers. And maybe if you remember 2019, even if it feels like uh, many, many years back, well, during that time, we were having a lot of uncertainty coming from different uh, uh, situations like uh, the trade wars between Trump and China with Europe in the middle, um, of course, Brexit. Um, so my job uh, and uh, uh, in, in this particular situation, it's always to bring long-term visibility and sometimes this is particularly difficult because of the many things that are always going on in the world. But it's always extremely important. It's to remain agile and decisive in terms of what is that we are going to be doing. But of course, um, last year, 2020 came and the big disruption um, just uh, uh, started really just to make this job even more difficult. So at that time, we had to start thinking about what is the data? What are the tools that we have to make decisions? I can tell you personally, my first uh, reaction was um, fear, not knowing what to do. And this was more because um, the human factor was coming in. But uh, what I think we, we should be appreciating is that, well, people started to think about how to make the best usage, uh, usage and utilization of the data and the knowledge that we were having and start using that uh, to make sure that we were able to make decisions. Of course, now we are just uh, looking into how artificial intelligence, uh, virtual uh, engagement tools, and many others that we are starting to use are helping us to make these decisions. And well, the job is not over. What we are uh, uh, still today is learning about how technology can help us to make some of these long-term decisions to support um, business uh, uh, strategies and uh, business plans. So what, uh, um, well, the other two speakers, Ruth and Michelle, were talking about is extremely uh, relevant for all the different organizations because we rely a lot more than ever on all the digital and uh, um, data elements that uh, we can have at our hand. Of course, I don't want to just leave out the human touch. And this is what, um, well, we do believe that is extremely important. At the end of the day, many of this data needs to be validated by people that have the expertise and the, the experience. And uh, also, I think that we should be keeping in mind that, well, relationships are made amongst humans. And I think that this is the element that, uh, well, um, has a very specific role as well and will continue playing a role. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Maria. And um, thank you for being so honest um, about how the last year, the last 15 months has uh, I think surprised us, impacted us, and then how we've responded, even though uh, everybody on stage would, would put ourselves forward as having some expertise and background in, 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 this, in this topic. We have some questions in chat, uh, sorry, in, in the question function already. So please use the question function uh, to alert us. We can also invite you onto stage and so uh, talk to our panelists directly or we can hear your reaction. And in fact, we're very keen for the next um, 20 minutes or so to hear from you. Um, we've got a general question and uh, uh, Kate, unless you um, want to come up on stage, 
maybe I just uh, read read out your question. Uh, government has to make quest uh, makes decisions all the time. What advice does this panel have to the PM how to manage and structure that process? Um, I'm happy to take a first a first stab. I think um, what's really I think what's really important is to take a system level perspective. So that might sound obvious, but um, there are more and more systems engineering systems of systems tools and methods that are being developed through research, but also applied. Um, but I mean, it historically has been applied a lot to development of space systems, and now it's increasingly being thought about to uh, support, for instance, infrastructure decisions, um, economic decisions. And, and these tools uh, aim to consider not just the uh, physical aspect, the physical considerations, but also, like Maria said, the human uh, stakeholders, the people, basically, the economics, the social value. So in my view, I think you know, systems engineering tool are, are extremely uh, important to consider uh, to support these processes. And there are many methods that exist to do that. Yeah, so Michelle, um, I think, has an excellent point about a systems perspective, sort of thinking about a lot of different pieces and putting them together. And I think that's a great point. I think the only thing I would add to that is one part I noticed from Kate's question is how to communicate it. And I think um, one of the challenges of decision making under uncertainty is communicating uncertainty with humans. This sort of maybe this will happen or maybe this will happen and we're not quite sure is is a very is very difficult to communicate. Um, and I think um, I think the only thing I would add to what Michelle's already said is just sort of people. Uh, I would want decision makers to actively engage with the uncertainty and sort of explain the uncertainty to um, uh, stakeholders, because I think the uncertainty and that you don't know what's going to happen is an important part. Um, the question that I got about uh, building tools. So the the presentation that I gave, of course, were um, data sets that happened to be perfect for my research, right? So what we do, and um, the Imperial Enterprise uh, team is extremely good at this, and then also within our research groups, we're quite good at this as well, is that when a new problem comes in, uh, we sort of figure out what are the components that the stakeholder needs. And then once we figured out what the stakeholder needs, we can sort of redirect the problem. So for instance, in the Imperial Enterprise team is already very, very good at this. And then uh, the computational optimization group, which I am a member of, um, we have me, who I'm more of a mixed integer optimization uh, expert. And then there's Panos Parpas, who is uh, a large scale nonlinear optimization expert. Uh, we have Calvin Say, who is a control expert. And so what we do is we then sort of try to deploy the individual problem to the person who is uh, best suited to it. Thank you ever so much, Ruth and, and Michelle. Really um, helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, please do keep the questions coming in using the question function. And as mentioned, if you'd like to come and give your perspective on, on, on an issue raised, um, we can invite you onto stage. Just put your hand up and raise your hand and we will pull you up. So, um, Maria, you you do this, uh, well, you, you can see some of the questions in chat. Maybe you want to pick up upon one of those, but uh, maybe I would ask your input on government. But government is just one pillar of, one pillar of society. Industry is, is um, uh, as important, more important. What's your perspective on these tools and, and what we, how we should deploy them? Well, that's that's a great question, and I think that uh, um, well, both Ruth and uh, Michelle were talking about uh, having a clear understanding about the system. I fully agree that having some sort of structure it's extremely important because there are so many choices that you can get lost. And I think that it's very clear, it's very important to understand what is the problem that we are trying to solve and what are the different resources, both uh, technology, but also uh, human knowledge that we can use to make decisions. I think that, um, you know, there are a few approaches that I find extremely useful in terms of, of course, uh, it's always very useful to have a good understanding about what is the, the macro um, environment, because this might be kind of impacting on areas that are kind of out of our control. 
but uh, certainly when they are impacting, the impact is quite large. So being very mindful about, uh, well, what's going on in the world that might be having uh, some sort of impact in the work that we are doing, it's, it's very relevant. And then try to understand uh, very well some of the key elements of each of the, um, well, different industries or different organizations. So what are the, um, the drivers, what are the risks, uh, and try to figure out a couple of scenarios. And, uh, you know, this is when uh, we are starting to use more and more technologies. So trying to develop, depending on, well, if we are in a super optimistic scenario, um, what is the data that we have to support? What might be the best decision? And uh, let's say, consider always another scenario where maybe things are not going as we are predicting. And then, um, well, what is that uh, might happen? Once you have like a couple of choices, um, and here I'm coming back to what Ruth was mentioning. I think this is also much better in terms of communication to other people that they feel like, okay, at least we have two different choices and uh, um, that's feeling much better than kind of making the super risky decision. So it's not easy. We need also just to have multiple checkpoints as we move forward. But uh, so far, well, what we feel is that um, you know, if you are very consistent in your approach, well, that at the end of the day, this is what we are looking for. So I hope it, it helps. Thank you so much, Maria. Our top question at the moment is uh, along the lines of, should we use these tools? Can we use these tools and simulations to play a useful role in decision making? So I'd love us to talk about that. Before we then take, take up the next set of questions around fear and gut reaction. So panel, uh, help us out with the, the first one of these. Um, yeah, since uh, many questions are around the processes and the tools, I'd like to give an example um, of the, ty the types of tools, for instance, that I'm developed through research and, and how that's been applied, for instance, working with companies uh, and or governments. So, for instance, uh, when I was in Singapore, I worked with Keppel Offshore and Marine, so that's a big oil and gas oil rig developer. Uh, I've also worked with the National Environment Agency and at the time, they were asking questions, for instance, what type of waste to energy technology should we deploy in the city? Uh, how much capacity should we put where? What type of technology to convert to bioethanol, uh, uh, compost, electricity, and so on? And so going through this process, I think, really helps understanding. So, I mean, you can frame it into a, a very high system level framework um, that involves typically five phases. And I'm speaking from, from my perspective, so I'd love to hear what Maria and Ruth think also, but um, it usually involves five phases when you think about flexibility or making these systems adaptable. So the first phase is you start from an initial design. So we're not gonna tell the government or a company like Keppel how to build oil rig. They know how to do that. So they start from this and the goal is to go through this process to improve the design, to deal better with uncertainty, but take uncertainty as a way to stimulate creativity. Instead of something that's scary, we actually try to take it as a way to think differently about the design. Uh, so we go through phases like uncertainty recognition, for instance, uh, using tools like scenario planning. So I know some of our audience are, are working with these tools. Then comes up the creativity bit where we're using these uncertainty scenarios and, and try to think, okay, how can we deal or how can we design a system that will help us to deal with that? If we have low, medium, high demand or price or something wrong happens, how can we design it? And you want to have these thoughts in the early upfront design before you actually start going through the detailed phases and building anything. Then afterwards, you go towards the design space exploration. This is where all the tools and optimization are extremely helpful. The tools that Ruth are developing are extremely relevant, multi-stage stochastic programming. Uh, in my case, I use a lot of economic modeling, uh, real options uh, modeling, for example, robust optimization that help you identify the best uh, design under uncertainty, the ones that will fare better, for instance, on an expected value basis. And then there's a whole process management. For example, how do you manage the different stakeholders through this whole design process? This is where tools like, for instance, someone was asking in the audience, uh, computer simulation. So I've been looking at, at virtual reality as a way to do that, right? Because imagine that I mean, a lot of the work that is done in research is we're going to come up with a nice equation for you and say, hey, here's the solution, trust us. Um, 
But imagine now that we could create an environment around you where you can experience this solution. So I'm telling you, this is the best way to design your oil rig or to operate your mine, for instance, or to deploy that waste to energy system so you can really navigate the system um, through virtual reality tools and experience that. And this is where I think engineers can play an important role in supporting and advising uh, policy and and, um, and decision makers, business leaders, really to experience that the system is designed this way. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. Really to feel these decisions using it as a training tool. We're getting lots of thoughts here, Michelle. Let's bring in let's bring in Maria um, just to uh, follow on. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I fully agree with uh, what Michelle was saying, and I think that uh, scenario planning is probably um, a very good way to get it started. I think that um, one of the worst parts of uncertainty is uh, um, this big question about what should I do? And uh, when you get it started into this scenario planning approach, um, first, you are pushed to get much more knowledge and insights about what's going on. And uh, this is making everyone feel a bit more comfortable because at least it's you are creating the awareness. And once that's happening, this is when you can start predicting depending on what are the different elements or variables that will be around you. Then I fully agree, uh, a very disciplined and rigorous uh, pr um, process review, it's also extremely important because you can maybe adapt and fix as, as you are getting any deviations and then, of course, this is when technology is uh, uh, helping us to go much faster than if we could be really just looking only into data in, in a manual way. So what I think it's, it's very important is to combine all the elements at the right speed and uh, uh, at the right time and have as well the right stakeholders. So this is where, again, the, um, I could say, human expertise is extremely important because they can be providing inputs into this scenario planning and then also just make sure that, well, they make sense uh, in different parts of the world or in different organizations. You know, I think that these are uh, the key variables that uh, I could highlight once again. But, you know, Michelle, I think spot on everything that you were explaining. Great example. Ruth, let's bring you on. Um... Feel free to follow up on, on uh, Michelle's and Maria's answers. But also, mischievously, I want you to see to see if you're willing to take the gut reaction um, question. You, we all know Gera Gigarenza's uh, work on gut reaction. Does that ever come into your work? In a word, no. Um, one thing I want to be very careful about is that I respect, um, one thing I really dislike is techno-solutionism, right? Is that just because there's a technology doesn't mean that like my the hammer that I develop is going to be the thing that's going to solve a problem, right? And I need to be very respectful of that. Um, so um, I am a mathematician and a computer scientist by training. I develop tools. Um, I try to develop tools that are applicable to the situation. I saw somebody in the chat talking about the importance of computer simulations. I think computer simulations are important because that's my world. Um, but I do have to be extremely careful about what is not my world. And what is not my world is the the sort of social sciences or expertise thereunto, right? And so actually, I, I think it's a little bit funny of Peter to, or a little bit, uh, as he said, mischievous of Peter to ask me because my work really is exclusive exclusively algorithms. Um, and so I, I, I acknowledge the limitation, right? Um, I am, I, my work is applicable in certain instances. Um, and I have worked with companies and they're using my stuff. Um, but I also acknowledge the limitations. And I think Peter in particular is head of design engineering at Imperial, which is my understanding of that whole department is that you really are trying to sort of put the algorithms together with the social sciences to some extent, at least. Um, uh, do I understand correctly, Peter? So we do do human in the loop decision making where we are running algorithms, but um, uh, one of our typical scenarios is that there may be a recommendation from 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 the uh, data driven approaches which says this is optimal, but the optimal may not be ex may not be societally acceptable, and so in our work for decision making under uncertainty we've actually put the human in the loop so the human in the loop can go unacceptable solution and 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 therefore explore what some people might regard as suboptimal 
but you, you've got some of the, as I say, human in the loop, it's a common phrase across so many domains now, and it's such a useful approach, I believe. Let's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I um, invite Michelle and Maria to pick up one of the other questions, we would love it, we would love it if one, of, one, or, one or more of you would like to come on stage and ask your question directly. You just raise your hand, I will spot it and bring you on. Um, Michelle, do you want to pick up upon Gerard's work? Um, I'm sure you know the you know, gut reaction and yeah. his, his work. I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of the questions. It's difficult to answer everything. Very good, excellent questions from the audience. Um, I think I think what Ruth mentioned is is really important. So, like many of us work in developing tools, and at the same time, um, you know, we're not the ones who will tell you what the solution is, right? So there's no cookie cutter solution. Every system is different. They all face different uncertainty sources. It's important to work together and basically see how to best use these tools. So that's what I wanted to add, basically, to what Ruth um, was saying. That's right. Maria, you've got a direct question on whether you could provide a flavor of the way in which your clients are using information and data. Well, it depends, you know, we have uh, um, a wide diversity of clients and um, each of them are using data in a very different way. So um, we, we are working with customers in, uh, um, as I was saying before, in the biopharmaceutical industry, um, in clinical and diagnostics, in food environmental, uh, chemical and energy, and each of them have very different type of um, problems or, or decisions to make under uncertainty. But uh, maybe I can, I can share with you um, some very kind of interesting examples that are starting to come immediately uh, when, when the pandemic um, just uh, uh, came in in 2020. So I was mentioning before um, the topic around, uh, well, the initial, I would say, human reaction about fear and what's going to happen and what are we going to do and, and uh, um, how to go on with our jobs. So many industries immediately started to look into how to shift from their current uh, working schedule into shifts that were allowing um, their workers to still come in during the whole day, make sure that they could really just be clients that decided to, instead of stay in the lab, work from home, but I still remotely manage everything that was going on in the in the lab. I think Michelle was talking before about uh, our virtual reality. Well, we were using that a lot and we were able to support our clients to make sure that, uh, you know, when there was something to be fixed and uh, because our um, support team was not able to go on site just to guide them through the process to make sure that they were able to just uh, continue their operations. So, you know, we have been experiencing um, quite an amazing number of different situations that I can tell you two years back, well, this wasn't our plans, but because of 2020, everything has kind of uh, accelerated tremendously. And we keep working on, you know, all of these uh, um, different elements. You know, look at this uh, uh, meeting today. Probably two years back, we were not thinking about just uh, joining in a virtual um, in a virtual lounge, going to this virtual backstage and doing all of those, these things online. But now still we are able really just to, to take the advantage of technology and also just to understand uh, how data uh, can be used. Um, I can maybe mention another great example that it's more related to, to data and how we can support our customers. And this is more around, well, having a very good understanding about um, when you are in a lab, how all your assets are performing and do as much of, I could say, um, in advance prediction about, uh, uh, well, what are the type of basic jobs that you need to do to make sure that you can maintain the operation during the longest time possible. So there are plenty of different situations where, well, we have been supporting our clients, but our clients have been as well um, just making this type of decisions. Thank you ever so much, Maria. That's most helpful. Uh, we have a lot of ups for the um, key assumption in dealing with uncertainty is that there's predictability to key features. Um, perhaps Ruth or Michelle, might you want to pick up with that? Will you ask the question again? I just don't see it. A for key assumption reason. in dealing with uncertainty 
is that there is predictability to key features of the uncertainty, such uh, as its yeah. range. However, some okay. scholars argue that the main challenge in dealing with de dealing is dealing with the extreme outliers. This is this is an amazing question because, of course, I think this is like already decision making is so complicated. And then when you incorporate the uncertainty, it's not that there's one type of uncertainty, it's many types of uncertainty. And I think this is where in particular um, David Silverman, who is part of the Imperial Enterprise team, wrote a wonderful article. And one of the things I think is so nice about that article is it highlights the way each of the different researchers he he discusses with um, sort of incorporates uncertainty in a different way into their algorithms. Um, and what I think is so important about that is that, as the question um, suggests, the, the, the types of uncertainty you're going to encounter are so heterogeneous, right? Is that, um, and of course, then I think also what the question is asking, how do you incorporate the bits that really are, are complete outliers or something like this? There are people who investigate uh, outlier detection uh, at Imperial as well, um, but it all ultimately, if it's an if it's an algorithm, right? There have to be a certain set of assumptions, and uh, what we try to do with stakeholders is identify what are uh, the assumptions when we're designing an an algorithm for them. Fantastic, thank you. And there, there's a question about um, the types of tools or the relative merits. I think it's it's and, and coming back with this idea that it's it's. I highly recommend to take a systems level perspective. Is that you choose the tools that you need depending on the problem that you're addressing, right? And so, for a particular type of problem, maybe an agent-based modeling approach will be better. For another one, it's going to be a discounted cash flow model, or or the ones that are mentioned in the audience. You know, uh, robust decision or di uh, dynamic adaptive policy. So it really depends on the problem that you're facing. Um, and I would say that you know, whenever you deal with uncertainty, even though these tools help you make recommendation on a particular metric. For instance, do you want to maximize your expected value? It's still possible that you've made the best decision, but that you're going to lose money, for instance, right? So you have to accept that um, even if, if those tools can guide you in the decision making, you have to accept that it's possible that um, even with that, uh, you, you might lose your shirt, basically. So, um, so, But essentially, the argument is that if you hadn't considered uncertainty or data or information, then probably the, uh, the decision would have been a lot more limited. So I think that's a key argument also when, when dealing with uncertainty. Maria, is there a question that uh, has attracted your attention? Yes, so actually, actually uh, Peter, I'm reading a couple of um, comments, questions around uh, collaboration, trust, because, well, all of a sudden, we are bringing uh, into the equation elements that uh, might not be on our daily uh, work or, or on our daily, um, I could say, environments. You know, there are people that are maybe working on, in isolation on their projects. And all of a sudden, we see this huge dependency of bringing, of bringing other perspectives into place. So, well, before we were talking about um, this scenario planning, there are many different approaches that uh, well i can i can share with you around uh, how to bring different perspectives and what is even more important different uh, capabilities and expertise to make sure that we can have a more reliable uh, kind of scenario planning or potential uh, choices for our decision making process so what we are seeing is that when we are bringing this very diverse type of uh, teams that are working towards uh, the same goal or the, si the same type of decision making, well, normally we are getting not just only into the resolution of the problem, but even many more opportunities that by working probably in a non-collaborative style, we could have been achieved. So I think that this has been one of the other great learnings during 2020, how collaboration and bringing more diverse perspectives can help us to go through, well, uh, the better understanding of, uh, of the different uh, uh, scenarios and, and what are the best decisions for the organization or to solve a business problem or, you know, whatever it is that we need to work on. So very interesting comment because it's not all about technology. As I was saying before, the human touch skill is very, very important. Fantastic. Um, we are at the end of this 
part of our session. So, um, Ruth, Maria, and Michelle, thank you so much for your insightful contributions. There are some questions that we've not fully addressed, and um, lots of you upvoted on on fear and gut reaction. And I know that you want more. And my my to an extent, that's some of the work that I engage with on ensuring definition of parameters and exploring the parameters, you know, making sure humans and stakeholders are there. And we've been working with political organizations uh, and, and um, definition of customers. What type of customers do you actually want? And how can you provoke a customer into a positive reaction? And the comments around fear these are tools which some people want to use. And so even if you don't agree with that, those approaches, these are tools which are adopted and included and approaches used in order to get a particular reaction. And so the human in the loop approaches to decision making would be something that I would suggest you look at or contact us and we will nudge you in the right direction. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the dozens of questions uh, that did come in. Delighted with that. And Ruth, Maria, and Michelle, thank you very much.